Okay, welcome again to the ELD MOOC 2015. Welcome to this afternoon session on returns from stakeholder and business-driven landscape restoration. I am Claudia Musekamp and I am the online tutor uh, with for this MOOC along with Ali Salah. Uh, I'm very happy today to introduce uh, Hans Schut to you. Hans Schut from the Netherlands. He's an expert in investment and finance and business development. And he has been in environmental businesses for a long time and will today uh, present um, his endeavor, Common Land on Landscape rest Restoration. Welcome with me, Hans Schut of the Netherlands. Thank you very much. Um, I have one problem, Claudia, that is to... Oh yeah, I can run through the slides now. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Thank you very much for inviting me to give this presentation. Uh, I must apologize if it uh, is going a little bit uh, sort of uh, difficult because uh, first of all, we had some technical problems and secondly, uh, I must apologize. This is for me the first time that I'm addressing an audience through a webinar. So I hope I will make it. Um, if it's okay, if it's right, you will see the slides now, the opening slide, just to check, and I'll try to get to the next slide. And I see it on my screen perfectly. I hope you see it too. Um, well, Common Land, uh, a Dutch non-profit organization, uh, founded about two years ago by Willem Verwerda, a former managing director of IUCN in the Netherlands, who had a dream and who sort of decided to dedicate the next phase of his career to really build and help build a landscape restoration industry. And actually, you see the slide here in front of you, uh, sort of the message that we convey to all the partners and parties we're working with is, uh, well, that's uh, the question, uh, would you agree if we told you that the most valuable asset on earth is soil? And I think we all agree with that. Uh, that is extremely uh, important uh, to save our soils because we know and we are aware that approximately one fourth of the world's land mass is really seriously degraded from centuries and centuries of human activities. And that's, I don't have to tell you that, I think, but uh, conversion, overgrazing, infrastructure, deforestation, etc., over harvesting, they're all causes why landscapes went down. And yeah, I think that it's crystal clear for everybody that to sustain as planet Earth in future, we need to sort of maintain and get back to a higher level. I think there are numerous examples. Uh, here you see hill slopes in South Africa, which are highly degraded by grazing. You see the difference where the fence was and where the sheep or the goats were grazing. grazing. We see similar developments in countries like Spain, where also degradation of landscape uh, in combination with droughts and all sorts of other aspects have caused serious uh, degradation of landscapes. It happens all over the globe in India. You see it also in sort of wealthy areas uh, like the Australian wheat belt where salination, and that's actually the part you see at the, f the forefront, uh, uh, um, wait a moment, I'm struggling with a screen that disappears on my computer, where you see in the forefront the salty areas in the, in the, in the, the, in the farmland. Uh, and, well, it's by nature. Uh, oh, wait a moment, something goes wrong again. I have a problem because the screen on my computer disappears. Apologies for the inconvenience, but I can't. Yeah, I'll go back this way. You see here a sort of a natural saline lake where actually uh, salinated uh, farmland 
sort of spoils all the materials and high level saline uh, deposits into natural lakes in the area and this really affects affects the land heavily so i think it's clear and and you may recognize this picture that in the magnitude of two billion hectares all across the globe are highly degraded and i think that also makes crystal clear that ecosystem restoration at a large scale is really crucial in future so that's where we're all working on uh, you and us uh, we are all working together on the same topic and uh, i think what it means effectively is that yeah it's crystal clear that uh, ecosystem restoration contributes not only to degrading this or re restoring land but also to a couple of related problems uh, that we see around us so topics like uh, general pollution climate change floodings droughts biodiversity loss poverty migration trends droughts security it's all it all has to do with land that is going and becoming worse and worse but i think the good news is that there are as you know and as you are aware and as you are working on there are ample opportunities to restore and work on ecosystems uh, mosaic landscapes with agroforestry activities new plantations crop fields and real attention for instance by organic farming and these kind of activities do help to restore ecosystems but I think the fundamental questions are, well, what, what, is, what is really needed to achieve scale? Who are the relevant shareholders? Who are the relevant stakeholders? How do we involve, and I think that is one of the crucial questions that, uh, that we have asked ourselves, is how to involve business in scaling up restoration? How to organize this process? How to attract the capital needed? If we talk about the two billion hectares uh, uh, I just showed you on the, on the picture, it's really a massive effort that needs to be done. And that makes actually that uh, we have said, well, one of our important aims is not only to, uh, to sort of organize stakeholder processes and try to restore landscapes, but in particular also to uh, mobilize capital and to see whether we can involve uh, the finance industry investors into landscape restoration so the question we have asked ourselves is how to make landscape restoration a industry an industry that ticks the boxes that meets the criteria of large institutional investors in future well the answer on this question is not easy but it has all to do with connection, uh, I could say. And, well, connectivity, connection is an important issue. Well, nature as usual is in fact about connectivity. Huh? Uh, there are many examples you can see, huh? maximization of the interaction between species, biomasses and ecosystems actually are, as part of a natural system, the basis of food water carbon oxygen and sort of all sorts of environmental aspects that we that we see uh, renewable energy sustainable energy it all has to do with the natural connection but i think when you want to connect business to nature and to ecology it's another piece of cake we are talking then about business as usual which is i'm a little bit exaggerating but it's about disconnectivity it's in business often still often to uh, my regret maximization of return on investment and you can add and per hectare so the business drive on maximization of returns is really also creating driving deforestation desertification biodiversity losses in climate change and all sorts of other social impacts as well so i think it's about uh, really working on sustainability it's about in a very simple picture um, if it comes through it's about the link to between sustainability and biodiversity we need to do actions on sustainability we need to fight the loss of ecosystems and biodiversity and 
I don't have to tell you as experts in this field uh, that, well, it's all about the environmental ceilings uh, on our planet Earth. Uh, you, you may recognize this picture of the, the social boundaries, the environmental boundaries. It's about the picture that you may also recognize the planetary boundaries, how it's often often mentioned and presented and used in, in various discussion. What we believe is that um, it's about sort of rethinking sustainability, how to involve the business community, how to link society, business community and ecosystems in a sustainable way on a long term, with a long term time horizon. Well, that's, of course, all obvious uh, to mention this, but I think uh, that when we look at businesses, when we look at ecosystems, when we look at economy, it's actually a perfect opportunity for the business sector to see this as a new growth market. And well, businesses are always, investors are always uh, keen on stepping into new untapped markets. Uh, so I think for sustainable economic development, uh, uh, well, the restoration industry, if we can make it an industry, if we can structure it as another market segment, is an interesting opportunity to develop. So landscape restoration, as I wrote it in this slide, represents a large untapped opportunity for sustainable economic development, whereby I think the important issue is for investors and for stakeholders that this is really long term. All other sorts of investments with short term time horizons uh, well, have an end. Uh, the, the fossil fuel industry well, is facing a potential sort of decline of uh, market potential. I would say the restoration industry is really a gross market for the long term. But there are numerous obstacles in ecosystem restoration. Obstacles in terms of the short term thinking, short time horizons uh, where investors look with through. Uh, there are obstacles in terms of the economic value of ecosystems that, that investors simply don't understand uh, how to explain the, value, the future value of land and keeping ecosystems, I think a lot of loss uh, made is not sort of incorporated in the pricing and in the value of the land. Uh, there are, when you're talking about ecosystem restoration projects, a lot of stakeholders involved that, that, that causes high risks, contrary stake, stakeholder interest could work detrimental. And uh, yeah, as a result, solutions are also often presented and, and overly complex to implement. So many projects uh, sort of started with high level of inspiration, with a tremendous lot of enthusiasm, but then sort of uh, go down or slow down uh, because it's, it turns out to be much more complex and complicated to implement. Another element there is silo thinking. Uh, we are all experts in our own field. I'm a financial expert. I don't know that much about ecosystems. So how to communicate, how to bridge uh, disciplines, how to get to a holistic integrated approach. But there are opportunities, I think, to address these uh, obstacles. So I think patient capital is an important issue. Uh, most of the investors around the globe are working with a three to five or seven years time horizon, which actually is too short. It takes a generation to really restore ecosystems, to grow new businesses, to, to transition, if it's not 20 years, at least 10 years. So what you need to work with, what you need to seek is sort of patient capital. And I think at in at this very moment, I think the impact investors market, the impact investors are uh, sort of more patient investors. They often have uh, uh, long-term horizons. When you talk about family offices, high net worth individuals in the world, there are many that really have a long time horizon and care for the plan. So try to involve impact investors first. But I think it's very important also that we sort of uh, uh, if I may call it so, that we teach the institutional investors. Uh, professional institutional investors have long, short-term time horizons, talk about liquidity of their investments. But when you look at the, the other side of their balance sheets, for instance, pension funds, pension funds actually 
have a very long time horizon because they know already 25 years in advance when that the people need to receive their pensions. So they can really invest on the long term and that's sort of a process we need to grow into. I think showcases are also very important. Show that it works, show the case, convince people by the excitement and the enthusiasm of things that happened and, and can happen. Uh, well. Obvious also for this course, stakeholder involvement and stakeholder, real stakeholder commitment is a critical success factor. So how to involve them, how to help them, how to sort of show them that we can create jobs, that we can create income, that we learn from it, that it also gives new energy, new hope, new purpose in life. And we have this actually said to ourselves, it's also important to have a very clear common language, a model that everybody understands on how to approach these projects and how to build these projects. Part of this model is that you also look at sort of a holistic systemic thinking approach. Uh, I think for the, the, the restoration leaders in this world, if I may, say, may, may call you so, uh, it's about connecting all stakeholders with one common approach, with a very clear purpose, with a clear picture, and with sort of a, a catalyzing, motivating approach in, 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 the, in the way of working. So what did Common Land? Um, our approach is actually based, uh, what we're actually saying is uh, landscape restoration, based on sustainable business cases. That's our model, the thinking model that we have tried to apply or that we are trying to apply. And what we're saying is we are delivering four returns, not only financial return, four returns in three line landscape zones with a simple and crystal clear language that all stakeholders understand. And let me guide you through, through this model. The clear stakeholder driven approach, one approach is actually sort of inspired by the fact that we need to involve in one or another way all stakeholders. So when you start in a landscape and you want to improve a situation in a certain country, you need to work with the local entrepreneurs, you need to work with local landowners, you need to take into consideration what the impact of your interventions are for local people. You need experts, NGOs, governance support to some extent, but don't make yourself too dependent of governments because that could also sort of slow down process from time to time. We need people that understand it from the business, from business schools. Uh, we need investors. So it's about involvement of stakeholders, but not only that, also look at what sort of proven technologies are. There are lots of technologies, there is a lot of, there are lots of lessons learned in other projects that, uh, well, you need to absorb, you need to see whether you can incorporate them in, uh, in your approach and uh, in your way of working. I mentioned you, uh, three zones for returns, I'll come back on them. Uh, when I look at a four, at a, at a situation in very, in many, in many degraded landscapes, what you see is de degradation leads to four sorts of losses, you may say. Loss of biodiversity, eroded hill slopes, loss of jobs because people move to cities because there is no future in, 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 in farming or in businesses locally. A loss of economic activity, and that sort of also gives a loss of meaning. And I think the, the, ch the, the challenge is, the opportunity is to turn that into the opposite. So restoration of landscapes provides four types of return. And we have mentioned that sort of return on inspirational capital, return on social capital, return on natural capital, and return on financial capital. Four returns. You may say, well, it's a little bit fake. What is inspirational return? Well, the interesting thing is I've talked to a lot of investors over the past year about common land, about our approach, about, well, your work, our work. And when you start, investors can always ask, well, what's, what's the return that I can make uh, in, in landscape restoration? Tell me. And so, well, 
four types of returns, inspiration return, and they, they really they really start listening because it's uncommon. It's it's a language that they haven't heard, but when you present it this way, inspirational return, social return, natural return, and financial return, they immediately understand what you're talking about. It's sort of a triple bottom line, but with inspiration uh, on top of that. And well, triple bottom line, they understand uh, four returns. Yeah, it's clear. Everybody understands. And then you go into the more details and, well, what is inspirational capital? What, how can you see that? Well, it's, it has to do with various aspects, and I've listed uh, a, a couple of them in this slide uh, where you see, uh, well, elements like meaningfulness, purpose in life, uh, awareness of what we're doing, sort of respect for local culture, etc. See landscape leaders coming up, uh, commitment of local uh, local uh, communities, etc. So, inspiration has different different dimension, but to be aware of it helps to shape projects, helps to make uh, investors more respect uh, responsive, and 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 make makes them listen. And I think what is interesting, and this is just a couple of uh, points you see here. To some extent, you can also measure it. So you can also report on it. Uh, in percentages, I think most of it is still qualitative measuring. But I think increasingly, you can also see, well, can we set ourselves targets for the return on certain of these elements and, and measure them uh, in a quantitative sense? I think the same applies for social capital, return on social capital. That's about jobs, that's about social security, that's about sort of building and increasing local social cohesion, that's about uh, creating a platform and, 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 and room for education and new social services. Also, act, uh, sort of impacts that you can measure either qualitatively or quantitatively. The next I mentioned, natural capital. Well, I think that's that's more common for, for all of us. Yeah, we're talking about increase of biodiversity, how to measure that, reduction of invasive species, uh, talking about vegetation cover, talking about the quality of the topsoil, and talking about, for instance, water, and there are more elements uh, that you can sort of distinguish when talking about uh, natural capital. So I think that is... Uh, uh, something that uh, well also fits into this picture, and last uh, but not least, in particular not least from an investor's perspective, is uh, sort of the financial return, which when you talk to investors in general sense is just very simple. It's the return on investment, or it is an IRR, an internal rate of return. We are investing one million, we are getting out cash flows. What is the internal rate of return? But actually. You should be aware, and also investors should be aware, that uh, investment in landscape restoration is sort of a combined mix, a basket of investments in all sorts of activities like agriculture, uh, uh, timber uh, harvesting, uh, uh, leisure, real estate, uh, water, uh, and that is measurable as sort of direct returns, what can I earn in terms of yields or value of production uh, in businesses like agricultural businesses, but also food processing, uh, uh, marketing distribution of uh, agricultural products, but there is also sort of reverse negative uh, earnings in terms of uh, the fact that erosion implicitly costs money and decreasing erosion is sort of adding value to the land, which is important, I think, for a country, which is important for a, re for a region. Uh, quality of topsoil is extremely important for the future, so it's not, it's not reflected in a, not always reflected in a value, but I'm sure that uh, once you're able to sort of restore and really improve the quality of the topsoil in a certain region, land prices will go up and the owners will sort of uh, see a value increase in their in their in their farms, in their businesses, in in the region. So the four the four returns are sort of our uh, reference uh, in order to sort of maximize on the all four returns in in, in a balanced and harmonious way. We 
try to apply a sort of a three zone landscape principle to every landscape uh, uh, restoration plan. And as I said already, uh, with a 20 years time horizon. So the three zones are actually sort of a nature zone, uh, where possible back to the original nature, but not necessarily to the sort of the original level. Uh, anyhow, an improvement of the nature zone. The second zone is an agro forestry uh, mixed zone, you could, uh, you could say. And the third one is more the economic zone, where we earn most of the money needed to get the financial component of the four returns. But in coherence, they generate uh, the four returns. So the nature zone, what are we talking about? We're talking about restoring vegetation. We're talking about plenty, planting native trees, about clearing invasive species, about sort of restoration of the nature and, and the appropriate maintenance to really make it a healthy zone in the region. And our belief is actually that that in actually any region where you're talking about even intensive agricultural uh, areas, you need to have a certain percentage of nature zone to sort of have biodiversity in the region, to have sort of interactions between the agricultural part or the agro and the forestry uh, zones with real untouched um, nature, if I may say so. And that's provides returns. It provides returns in terms of CO2 capture, it uh, provides returns in terms of water buffering, uh, it contributes to nearby topsoil, uh, biodiversity could increase, and well, in the business sense, it could also help uh, uh, forestry hunting, tourism, and these kinds of activities, which is actually more or less similar to the combined zone. I, uh, we were explicitly looking at the combined zone because when you talk about uh, more uh, agroforestry and, and uh, uh, for instance, trees that produce at a less intensive level uh, certain uh, fruits or nuts or whatsoever, you can really build a zone that creates some return and is able to maintain its own financial balance. So the combined mixed agroforestry zone is a second zone. And the third one, the economic zone, is really where the business takes place. Of course, that could be uh, farming businesses, intensive farming business, but well, obviously, uh, wherever possible in a sustainable way, uh, organic or biodynamic or anyhow permaculture type, uh, uh, anyhow in a sustainable way, there are many sort of developments that I don't have to explain you. But it could also be, well, processing industry. So we have, when we look at a landscape and we talk with farmers, we look at, well, can we, you're, you're in the core uh, sort of uh, primary production, but would it be possible by teaming up with other stakeholders in this area to team up and to add some value to our primary production, for instance, by processing our crops jointly or bringing them to the market jointly so that we have a more stronger market voice and, and are able to get better prices, etc. Um, so in our landscape approach, we look at farming activities, joint farming activities, but also other activities uh, further in the value chain and, and, and other businesses that sort of have a positive impact on the quality of the landscape. And I think if you look at businesses, there are quite a number of businesses that by nature of their core process can contribute to, uh, to landscape restoration. Uh, when you talk about process industry, uh, even with large supermarket chains, sort of their requirements on the product quality, quality and uh, sort of the way these products are produced uh, also drives a sustainable movement in the primary production. So, involve business where possible. So, um, it is actually looking at this system all about sort of a, a long-term business model where we try to optimize the four returns generated in three zones, which is the simple language we're using, on a 20 years time horizon where 
it is very difficult, uh, very important to realize and also to structure the investments and the projects in such a way that the local stakeholders see their results relatively quickly yeah, because you need to really mot motivate them and keep them online. And, uh, uh, well, it's about uh, really working with the stakeholders in an, in an in a business oriented way. So what we typically do in a landscape is that we look at the landscape as a whole, we design jointly with the landowners sort of a overall master plan, the idea on how this landscape uh, could look like if you apply the three zones methodology and when you look at sort of their own ideas what they already that, that they often already have about what could be done in another way or in a more innovative innovative way and then uh, start from there and sort of design the business plans for their farms for their businesses the improvements in the business plans and help them to attract finance but i'll run through the approach uh, in the in the next minutes let me see where are we in time uh, half an hour approximately done um, so um, well i already said it in the beginning uh, what we want to do by our approach is increasing the understanding that maximization of final financial returns per hectare leads to short-term uh, uh, profit and long-term loss and we want to reverse that actually and show that a business approach makes sense so that uh, is that means that we are working on landscapes with entrepreneurs and what we actually doing and that's our stakeholder management we call it sometimes stakeholder orchestration we orchestrate their interactions and we catalyze them to creatively design new products um, there are a couple of technologies for that, how to do that. Uh, you may have heard about Theory U, which is a, a methodology of sort of very creatively with an open mind uh, uh, co-creating the future. It's a methodology designed or developed by the Presencing Institute of MIT. Uh, a guy called Otto Scharmer has applied this methodology, developed this through, and simply by asking the good questions you can really in a stakeholder setting with all different people from different nature and background work on a very inspiring and co-creating process so i would any i would recommend anyone to look into theory you and and and, and uh, the presencing institute visit methodology we have done that in a couple of examples uh, for instance with a group of farmers in uh, in uh, spain uh, in the Altiplano, where, well, huge problems, uh, degraded landscape. They all had their sort of their dreams of what they want to achieve in the future, but how to achieve it, how to, how to run it. So we applied with our team a couple of sessions. We, we facilitated a couple of sessions, applied CRU there, and uh, worked with them on sort of a picture and a sketch of the future of which you see sort of one of the slides uh, they drew up there during this meeting uh, in this uh, picture. So it's a matter of, uh, and it's simpler said than done, a matter of engaging with all the stakeholders in a landscape. It's a matter of designing with them sort of a landscape restoration plan based on real business cases underneath it. So business cases where you invest in business and yes of course there are also interventions needed that are sort of not business driven that do not generate a return so i think what we then do is that we really support the business in designing their uh, business plans determining what sort of level of investment be it investment uh, in, in types of equity or loans or, or other financial support is needed and then help the entrepreneurs help the businesses in the landscape to attract that funding. I think it's not a matter of just designing a plan, it's a matter of really helping. And well, from my financial background, it's sort of corporate finance support that we try to attach immediately after developing the business plan to the to the services to the farmers so that we help them to attract capital and uh, really get all the enablers uh, organized and done. 
Um, yeah, and these business plan in the landscapes, it's, it's really also about uh, what is the landscape and what is our dream. Can we improve it? Eh? Restoring, restoring your soil is restoring your soul. So sketch the future. What are the interventions? What are the, the things you want to change in your plan? And then let's see whether we can make this a viable, financially viable business case and how to attract the funding for it. When we took a look at, at our roles here, uh, you see this very simple picture, which actually shows landscape restoration projects and ventures. So it's the project where we may have certain interventions in the landscape. Uh, sometimes subsidies are possible or needed for certain interventions, but the majority, the, the sort of the core of our focus is on building the businesses and the, and the ventures. So we have we establish a sort of development company in a country we're working and our landscape orchestrators, landscape mobilizers, or how we call them, are working with the stakeholders in the landscape. Uh, and we know that uh, we are going to help these ventures with attracting funding from local investors, local venture capital funds, local funds, and really helping to organize the, the funding. Uh, it could be funding internationally, but we also are developing our own investment fund in order to help uh, uh, the farmers, to help the entrepreneurs with, uh, with the funding needed. Um, I think that's very important because uh, yeah, without funding, no success, no next steps. Um, what we are doing then in, in our development companies is that we are, first of all, of course, scouting for the right sort of mixture and, and, and composition of the stakeholder uh, uh, group we are working with. Uh, we bring them in contact with experts, so, uh, and we already align investors where possible in the early stage, then subsequently start to develop the business plans with the farmers, the landowners, and other entrepreneurs, uh, and orchestrating and facilitating all the parties around, and then, well, mobilize the capital and other funding, either from our own investment fund or from outside parties uh, that are around and already sort of lined up uh, to the extent possible. In order to sort of learn, we have also structured the process. We are actually in the process of developing a toolkit for the different uh, phases in our landscape orchestration uh, project. Uh, I won't, won't go into the details of these tools. They are still in development, but we will also, uh, as soon as there are sort of a little bit more progress, make them available for others to apply, because we really believe that the combination of a common language, such as the, the four returns, three zones, 20 years that we use, in combination with a sort of flexibly to apply toolbooks toolbox uh, field guide could be helpful for many of you and many others to, uh, to uh, manage these processes uh, around the globe. Um, well, um, maybe some repeat in my presentation, but uh, uh, as I said, uh, the Common Land Foundation scouts landscape restoration projects, identifies farmer stakeholders, and uh, we develop, uh, the development companies orchestrate uh, the stakeholders, designs the master plans, helps to develop business cases, attracts the funding, and the fund together with other investors invest in the landscapes. Well, this is it in brief. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, uh, as I uh, already repeated a couple of times, four, zone, four, re four returns, three zones, 20 years in landscapes. Uh, we do this not on our own our founders, our mission partners, where we work with on developing this industry are very important for us and we, we are very glad that we got this support and the interactions with many organizations around the globe. Uh, and I think we are all driven by one sort of common uh, awareness and that is that, uh, of course, uh, yeah, this is our planet, our common land, it's our home, let's take good fair care for it all together, and together is with uh, uh, stakeholders. Well, I think that was it for now, so thank you for your attention. I hope you 
heard my old, whole presentation because it's quite an uh, experience not to have an audience uh, in front of you, but uh, well, I hope uh, this uh, landed. Okay, thank you Hans for this great presentation. Uh, let's give Hans Schut a hand. I think that was a wonderful introduction into what Common Land is doing and how uh, an integrated approach uh, benefits the land and the stakeholders as well. So thanks a lot. Uh, I do appreciate it, uh, particularly because uh, there were some technical issues and Hans and um, my colleague Ramona had to go undergo a lot of consultation before we uh, could get this uh, to work. Uh, thanks to all who have joined in the meantime. I see a lot of thank you for uh, from the audience here in the chat box. Uh, we would have time to take some questions. So if you have a, um, a moment, so there's a question. Do you mind to explain the toolkits with the scaling numbers? I think that refers to the slide with the um, circles and the, the toolkit. I am afraid, I'm afraid I don't exactly grab the question. Um, uh, may, I, I may, I think I know which um, um, slide we are talking about. I guess that's this one. This one. What are the numbers are all about? Um, actually, what you see, the numbers are a relative factor. This is sort of a, a spider type of tool uh, that we use to select projects in our uh, pipeline. And it's just as an example. Uh, so when you talk about, from our perspective, about where are we going to uh, work, uh, we have used this as a tool. But it's just an example, so not really something that you can apply uh, uh, easily. I think it's important to have these tools because investors that we want to interest really are looking at, uh, for instance, what you see at the right-hand side, uh, political stability, uh, fit with policies, uh, uh, and issues like uh, investment climate, etc. So uh, it, is an, it is just an example of one of the tools that we use in our, our selection criteria and, and when you go one step deeper in the in the orchestration and process with, with uh, these projects you can also apply similar sort of tools on the selection of ventures and investments do they meet criteria etc I hope this answers the question unfortunately I can't see the, the chat box uh, for one other reason it's my screen changed but uh, uh, maybe uh, Claudia, when when it's uh, when you sort of see a response on my answer to the question, please let me know. Okay, I guess that uh, was a very good reply to the question. There's another question: uh, Do you have an example when the stakeholders group uh, is was present theoretically, but in fact the interest in the area? from stakeholders is not there. Um, there's this question because uh, in in the country, uh, in that respective country, the valuation of ecosystem service is an uh, abstract concept and involves someone to a 20 years project is almost unreal. Mm. Um. I think that uh, what you what we try to do is, uh, uh, of course, when designing a project, to look at shorter timeframes to measurable successes. I think when you talk about a 20 years time frame, you're talking about a 
period that is really needed to achieve a significant change in the sort of the quality of the landscape. But having said so, when you start when you start a business in that region, uh, for instance, processing of uh, certain nuts uh, and adding value by making it a niche product, and we have we are doing such a project in Spain, for instance, uh, with almonds, uh, then your your expected success of the business concept is already uh, taking place after two or three years. Uh, and uh, I think in that sense it's important to have a long-term time horizon for those aspects, those interventions and activities that really require the long time horizons, but, but sort of uh, uh, pick the low-hanging fruit of those projects that can show results sooner than later. So I agree that it's sometimes uh, not realistic, but on the other hand, uh, I think it's also we really need a paradigm shift in the financial short-term thinking, and uh, that's not easy to, to achieve, but uh, it's sort of urgently needed in this industry, uh, I believe. So, yeah, not a full answer to the question, I believe, but uh, balance it and try to pick out those things that show results uh, rather quickly. Okay, uh, there is a question. What is the best entry point for participatory processes? Um, there are different ways. There are sometimes uh, pharma organizations that are uh, an entry point. Uh, we also have encountered uh, quite a number of NGOs that are already business with busy with uh, uh, sort of consultations and discussions. Uh, it's really a matter of uh, getting a sense of who is already thinking and acting in this area and then sort of teaming up with them to see whether uh, this approach could be sort of broadened and made more holistic. Um, I think what's crucial is to have landowners on board to involve them because, yeah, without landowners and without their interest in a more sustainable future, it doesn't make sense to, well, maybe not, maybe to, to, to black and white, but it's, it's more difficult to sort of really motivate and involve people. So landowners, existing NGOs, uh, I would say, tend to say less important in the first phase to have governments. Governments will follow as soon as the as sort of the the, the economic uh, society starts to work uh, on these projects. Hope this answers the question. Mm -hmm. Okay, two last questions. One is how big is a project area and how are projects selected? Um, on the project selection, uh, well, we have done, we have seen quite a lot of projects and we, uh, for ourselves to sort of uh, select uh, a couple of uh, first projects in our portfolio, we have applied a selection tool which is sort of similar to what you see on the screen behind you, a selection along different criteria which in from our perspective are related to the chance that we are able to achieve a balanced mix of the four returns. So we have applied our uh, tool uh, of our, our own selection tool in this respect. And sorry, I forgot the, the, what was the first question was. How big is the, the area, the project area, how big is it? Oh yeah. Yeah, that is actually, that highly depends on, on the local situation, of course, but, but uh, we believe that it's important to have really a quite a substantial area to work on because you want to have impact, you want to achieve impact. For instance, in South Africa, we are working in a region called the Bavians Clove, uh, and don't ask me the numbers of hectares, but I think it's... Uh, over 50,000 uh, from the top of my head. So I believe that working in large areas uh, should be should 
should be tried. Uh, well, it's always difficult in large areas to get everybody in involved, but I also strongly believe in an approach in which a couple of sort of front runners, innovative landowners, farmers, entrepreneurs, sort of start a movement. Uh, and then uh, all the neighbors looking over the fence, what's happening there? And if we can show results relatively quickly and really show that we are uh, authentically and intrinsically motivated working on, on the future of the whole area, they may quickly fall, follow. So I really believe uh, uh, look at a sufficiently large scale, find the innovators in that area and try to team up with them in, in call it landscape partnership uh, models. Okay, thank you. And the very, very last, last question is how would the system work if the land belongs to the government? Uh, it's a good question. I think uh, in many areas, large parts of the land belong to the government, but uh, there is always also private ownership of land, uh, I think. And what is important is to involve, depending on where you see the need for the interventions in the landscape, to involve the government at the right point in time and, and at the right level. And uh, yeah, it's, it's very dependent on the location, it's very dependent on the local governments, what is possible, but I think it's important when you're working with private sector players, private sector stakeholders, that you don't make the project dependent on governments, but having said so, on the other hand, when you're talking about significant parts of the land which are owned by the government, it's also extremely important to involve the government. And I think many governments highly appreciate private sector uh, uh, initiatives and, uh, and if we organize it for them, uh, it might also lower the hurdle for governments to get these projects up and running. I realize it's not a very concrete answer to your question, but uh, uh, I hope it's anyhow an answer. Okay, there's so many questions, but I'm taking this very last uh, one from my fellow tutor, Ali Salah. Uh, how do you guarantee the commitment of stakeholders over 20 years project time frame? That is an interesting question. I think uh, there are two, two aspects to this question. One aspect is that uh, it should be that the approach that you're taking should really be in the best interest and should benefit the stakeholders themselves. If, you, if they really see and feel that you're working for their best interest, they will stay involved. I think the question to some extent has a question, a reverse question as well. Stakeholders in a couple of the areas where we're working on have asked us, how long do you stay on board as orchestrators of this uh, stakeholder process? And I think that is also an important issue that uh, uh, yeah, many projects depending on sort of one-time subsidies uh, may end after two years or the consultants may run away because uh, their assignment is over and then sort of uh, a project falls down. So we really have discussions with our stakeholders uh, about uh, uh, our long-term involvement and also about sort of assuring that we can continue to help them uh, orchestrate, help, support uh, to build the new future uh, and, and in that sense uh, the role of landscape orchestrate this landscape mobilizes need, also needs to be long term and sustainable. So it's, it's a very important question uh, you're asking and I think the answer is from two angles it's important to, uh, to find a uh, sustainable long-term basis, otherwise uh, you're doing a lot of interventions and uh, yeah, uh, uh, the project uh, uh, 
holds or there is the risk that the project holds as soon as you're running away or as soon as it has no meaning or no uh, interest for the stakeholders involved anymore. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks for taking all these questions. Thanks again for the great presentation. Thank you. Um, Welcome. Okay. Um, I guess some of our participants had prepared uh, to be presenting today. I'm sorry that uh, we need to do that next week or uh, any during one of the next sessions um, because there were some tech issues today. Uh, I'd kindly ask all those who would like to uh, do a presentation next week to stay till the end. I will stay tuned along with Ali Salah and we'll discuss next week. Next week's speaker will be Cesar Morales and he'll be presenting on uh, stakeholder engagement in uh, land degradation in uh, Latin America. So next session will be uh, hosted by Ali Salah and uh, I will see you in uh, two weeks. So again, thanks Hans Schut, thanks all of you for joining. Now we come to the fun part and uh, you may switch on your webcam. Yeah. Um, all cameras on. Now we have to the opportunity to wave at each other. Hello, Anna. Hello, Ali. <laughs> Hello, Toby. I see Jibril. I see Kudrat. Hello. Just reply to your mail. <laughs> Irina. Hello. Sorry if I didn't get all the uh, mail in the teams. I'm sort of a member of all teams and um, we uh, some mail have slip, may have slipped through. There were so many holidays in Germany these uh, last two three weeks, and a lot of family business waiting. So again, oh, I see the young ones are joining our sessions. Kudrat, hello, <laughs> young lady. Here comes the future. Okay, that's good. very good. Jennifer, hello. <laughs> I'm glad that the young ones are joining our sessions. <laughs> yeah, hello to everybody. Thank, thank, thank you also, all of you, for listening uh, to my presentation and uh, well, wishing you a lot of success and inspiration in in this work and uh, uh, a lot of learning and pleasure in the in this uh, wonderful thank course. You. Hello, Jibril. I see. You. And yeah, thank okay. you, Hans. Mm -hmm. I hope you don't mind that I'm switching off now because I'm bound to leave for another meeting. Okay. So, uh, wishing you a good uh, continuation of this course. Okay, thank you. Bye bye. bye. So, um, Anyone, I've put all microphones on now, so anybody who would like to talk and talk about the presentation next week um, may do so now by switching on the microphone. Ephraim is still on. Our oh, man in Rome. And <laughs> then mm. bye bye. Jennifer still on, Jibril, okay, bye-bye, see you next week. Mm. Uh, Panaton, my friend Panaton, from how are your studies doing? Okay. Oh, 
exams with Panaton next month. Oh, I know that's always a horrible time. Exam time, you really need to study hard. But um, I will think of you. I will think of you and hope that you will have really good results in your exam. I know that you're studying hard. Doing the university and the MOOC, that's a really big thing. Yes, good luck. That's the future. Young ladies, I saw the very young lady from, I guess it's Kudrat's uh, um, daughter, the very young ladies and young ladies like Panaton, you are the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, I guess I'm going to say goodbye now. Is there anybody who would like to do the presentation next week? Uh, you may. Um, I've switched on our microphone, so if you want to talk, um, you may do so now by switching on your uh, presentation. Okay, Jenny, you're asking Anarisa. Yes. Um, yes, all uh, we do a recording. Actually, I should 